two. A task simple in the telling. Very good, said Albrecht, when all the prisoners had volunteered. Now you shall hear your mission. He indicated a grizzled veteran at his side. Under the command of Captain Vert here, you shall escort Lady Magda Bandauer, an abbess of Shalia, to a Shalian convent in the foothills of the Middle Mountains. A holy relic lies there in a special crypt. Lady Magda shall open the crypt, then you will escort her and the relic back here to me with all possible speed. Time is of the essence. He smiled. It is a task simple in the telling, but I have no need to remind soldiers of the Empire, no matter how debased, that the lands twixt here and the mountains are not entirely reclaimed, and that the mountains have become the refuge of chaos marauders, Kurgan, Norse and worse. We have word that the convent was recently pillaged by the Kurgan. They may still be in the area. You will be sorely pressed, but for those who survive and return the relic and the abbess to me, the Empire's munificence will know no bounds. Reiner heard little of Albrecht's speech. He had stopped listening after Abbess of Shalia. Another sister of Shalia? He had barely survived his encounter with the last one. Granted, that had been a sorceress in disguise, but once bitten, twice shy, as the saying goes. He wanted no more to do with that order. They weren't to be trusted. Eric, the blonde knight, seemed to have some objections to the plan as well. Do you mean to tell me, he burst out indignantly, that we are to be led by this, this foot soldier? I am a knight of the scepter. My horse and armor cost more than he has made in his whole career. Bloody jagger, muttered Hals. My spear has killed more northerners than his horse and armor ever will. Captain Verd also outranks you, said Albrecht. He has thirty years of battles under his belt while you are what? Vexillary? Bugle? Have you even blooded your lance yet? I am a nobleman. I cannot take orders from a common peasant. My father is Frederick von Eisenberg, Baron of... I know your father, boy, said Albrecht. Would you like me to call him and tell him how many young knights you have slain and maimed in affairs of honor? You deprive the empire of good men and call it sport. Eric's fists clenched, but he hung his head. No, my lord. Very good. You will obey Captain Vert in all things. Is that clear? Yes, my lord. Good. Albrecht surveyed the whole group. Horses are waiting for you at the postern gate. You leave at once. But before you go, your commanding officer has a few words. Captain... Captain Vert stepped forward and looked at them all in the eye, one by one. His glance shot through Reiner like an arrow from a longbow. You have been chosen for a great honor tonight, and offered a clemency which none of you deserve. So if any of you attempts to abuse this kindness, by trying to escape, by betraying our company to the enemy, by killing each other or sabotaging the mission, I will give you my personal guarantee that I will make the rest of your short life a living hell the likes of which will make the depredations of all the demons of chaos look like a country dance. He turned toward the door and limped toward it. That is all. Reiner shivered, then joined the rest as the guards began herding them out. If nothing else... Albrecht made sure they were well kitted out. They were led through the castle and out through the postern gate, where a narrow wooden drawbridge spanned the moat. On the far side, on a strip of cleared land flanked by a fallow field, a pack mule and ten horses were waiting for them, their breath white steam in the chill night air. The horses were saddled, bridled and loaded with regulation packs, complete with bed rolls, rations, skillet, flint, canteen, and the like. Reiner's saber was returned to him, a beautiful weapon, made to his measure, and the only gift his skin-flint father had ever given him that was worth a dam. There was also a padded leather jerkin and sturdy boots to replace the ones taken from him in the brig, 
as well as a dagger, a boot knife, saddlebags full of powder and shot, and two pistols in saddle holsters, though not loaded or primed. Albrecht was no fool. A cloak, steel lobster tail bassinet, and back and breastplate strapped over the pack completed the inventory. Almost everybody seemed satisfied with their gear. Only Ulf and Eric complained. What's this? asked Ulf angrily, holding up a huge iron-bound wooden mole that looked bigger than Sigmar's hammer. Is this a joke? Vert smirked. Tis the only weapon we know you're competent with. Do you ask a knight to ride a pack horse? interrupted Eric. This beast is purely fourteen hands. We go into the mountains, your grace, said Vert dryly. Your charger might find the going a bit rough. Looks tall enough to me, said Howes, eyeing his horse uneasily. Aye, said Pavel. Can you make him kneel so we can get on? Sigmar save us, said Eric. Will we have to teach these peasants how to ride? Oh, they'll pick it up quick enough, said Reiner. Just learn from his lordship, lads. If you ride like you've got a pike up your fundament, you're on the mark. Pavel and Halls guffered. Eric shot Reiner a venomous glance and turned towards him as if he meant to pursue the matter. Fortunately, at that moment, Albrecht came through the gate, leading a chestnut palfrey on which sat a woman dressed in the robes of an abbess of Shalia. Reiner's fears were somewhat allayed when he saw her, for Lady Magda was a stern, sober-looking woman of middle years, attractive enough in a cold, haughty way, but by no means the sort of dewy-eyed, waif-like temptress that had so recently been his ruin. This woman looked like she measured out the charity of Shalia with an assayer's scale, and healed the sick by shaming them into health. She seemed as unhappy to be travelling in their company as they were to be in Verts. She looked over them with barely concealed disdain. Only when Albrecht led her to the place beside Vert did Reiner see her show anything like human feeling. As the Baron handed her her bridle, he took her hand and kissed it. She smiled down at him in return and stroked his cheek fondly. Reiner smirked. There was some fire in the cold sister after all. Still, the moment of affection gave Reiner pause. Why would Albrecht leave a woman he cared for in such disreputable company? It was curious. When they were all mounted, Albrecht faced them. Ride swiftly and return quickly. Remember that riches await you if you succeed, and that I will kill you like dogs if you betray me. Now go, and may the eye of Sigmar watch over your journey. He saluted as Vert spurred his horse and signaled them forward. Only Vert, Eric and Reiner returned the salute. As they started down the rutted dirt road, between tilled fields towards the dark band of forest in the distance, it began to drizzle. Reiner and the rest all reached behind them to unstrap their hooded cloaks from their packs and pull them on. Hals grumbled under his breath as the rain sputtered his forehead. There's a good omen for ya, and no mistake. It rained all night, turning the road to mud. Spring was coming to Ostland as it did every year, cold and wet. The party rode through the moonless night, huddled in their cloaks, teeth chattering and noses running. The throbbing pain of his brand was now only the first in a long list of miseries that Reiner mentally added to with each passing mile. They could see little of the countryside. The woods were pitch black. Only when they passed open fields, where the previous week's blanket of snow was melting into grey slush, was there enough light for them to see any distance at all. Smallhof was one of the Empire's easternmost marches, and there was much forest and few towns. It was relatively safe, however. The tides of chaos had crested, then receded back east and north, leaving the land desolate, even of the bandits and beasts that normally terrorized the local farms and towns. The few crude huts they passed were mere blackened shells. Just before dawn, 
as Reiner was nodding and swaying in the saddle, Vert called a halt by a river. A patch of tall pines clustered near it, and into this he led them. It was black as a cave within the spinney, but the ground was almost dry. Vert dismounted briskly. We'll rest here until dawn. No tents. And sleep in your gear. What? said Reiner. But dawn's only an hour away. His lordship said time is of the essence, said Vert. You'll get a full night's sleep when we make camp tonight. Another day of riding, moaned Howells. My arse won't stand it. Would your arse rather be swinging by a rope? asked Vert darkly. Now, get your heads down. Urquhart, help me. While the company saw to their horses and made pillows of their bedrolls, Ulf and Vert put up a tidy little tent for Lady Magda that included a folding cot. When it was finished and Lady Magda installed within, Vert lay down in front of it, blocking the entrance. Don't worry, Captain, said Howes under his breath. We don't want none. He laughed and nudged Pavel. Ha! Get it? We don't want none? Aye, said Pavel wearily. I get it. Now go to sleep, ya pillock. Blood of Sigmar, I don't know which hurts worse, my head or my arse. Reiner woke with a start. He had been having a vivid nightmare that Kronhoff, Altdorf's most notorious moneylender, was drilling through his left hand with a carpenter's auger as punishment for unpaid debts, when someone in the dream had begun banging on an iron door. He opened his eyes and found himself in the pine spinney, but the pain in his hand and the banging continued. It took a moment to remember that he was now a branded man, and another moment to realize that the horrible noise was Vert, banging his skillet against a rock and shouting, Rise and shine, my beauties. We've got a long day ahead of us. I'll make him eat that skillet in a minute, growled Howells, clutching his head. Reiner climbed painfully to his feet. He wasn't sore from riding. He was a pistolier, born to be in the saddle. But lack of sleep made his bones feel like they were made of lead. They dragged at his flesh. The pain in his hand seemed to have spread to his head. While the rest of him was frozen, his head felt on fire. His eyes ached. His teeth ached. Even his hair seemed to ache. Worse than Vert's banging and shouting was his clear-eyed alertness. To Reiner's annoyance, the man seemed utterly unaffected by lack of sleep. Lady Magda was the same. She waited calmly outside her tent, hands folded, as clean and pressed as if she had just led morning prayers. Vert chivied them through a rushed breakfast of bread, cheese and some ale, and then back onto their horses. Last to mount were Pavel and Halls, who lowered themselves onto their saddles with much hissing and groaning, like men settling bare arsed into foreign bushes. Less than half an hour after waking, they were on the road again. The rain had stopped, but there was no sun. The sky was a featureless and uninterrupted grey from horizon to horizon, like a dull pewter tray hung upside down over the world. The party pulled their cloaks tight around them, and leaned into a wet spring wind as they rode towards the middle mountains, which rose out of the seemingly endless forest like islands in a green sea. As the day went on, and they left the scrubby wastelands of the east behind, the forest grew denser and they came across a few villages, tiny communities carved out of the wilderness and surrounded by winter fields. But while these so typically imperial sites should have cheered men so long from home, Instead, the convicts' faces grew longer and longer, for the villages were empty shells, sacked and burned to the ground, with rotting skeletons strewn about like children's playthings. Some still smoked, for though the war was officially over months ago, Chaos Warlord Archon and his hordes having at last been pushed back beyond Kislev, fighting continued, and doubtless would for some time. The endless forest of Ostland could swallow armies whole, with scattered bands of marauders 
lost or left behind by their fleeing compatriots, still wandered it, looking for food and easy plunder. Other Northmen had reportedly fled into the Middle Mountains and stayed, finding the frozen heights to their liking. Still reeling from its all-or-nothing fight, the Empire was too busy regrouping and rebuilding to send armies out to vanquish these scavengers, and so it was left to the beleaguered local lords to defend their people with the ragged remnants of their household guard. But here, in these forsaken hinterlands, no lord but Karl Franz held sway, and the villagers must fend for themselves or die. Most often they died. In one village, decapitated heads rotted on spikes mounted on the palisade. Bodies decomposed where they had fallen because there was no one left to bury them. The stench of death rose from wells and barns and cottages. At noon they passed the Temple of Sigmar. The old priest had been crucified before it, his ribs pried back and his deflated lungs flapping in the wind like wings. Pavel and Hulls cursed under their breath and spat to avert bad luck. Eric rode straighter in the saddle, his jaw muscles twitching. Franz shivered and looked away. Reiner found himself torn between hiding his eyes and staring. He never had much use for priests, but no man of the Empire could see such a thing and be unaffected. After a lunch eaten in the saddle, a watery sun came out and the mood lifted a little. The forest receded away from the road, and for a while they rode through a marshy area of rushes and clumps of snow that dripped into meandering streams. The men began to talk amongst themselves, and Reiner found it interesting to see how the group sorted out. He was mildly surprised to see Pavel and Hals, a pair of Ostland farmers, who had never left their homeland before being called to war, getting on well with the Tylean mercenary Giano. The typical insularity of the peasant, to whom even Altdorf was a foreign country, and who viewed all outsiders with mistrust, seemed to have been trumped by the commonality of all foot soldiers, and soon the three were laughing and exchanging tales of rotten provisions, terrible billets, and worse commanders. Behind them, little Franz and giant Ulf talked in low tones, a confederacy of the teased, thought Reiner while bringing up the rear were Gustav and Oscar, riding in glum silence and staring straight ahead, a confederacy of the shunned. Vert rode at the head of the party with Lady Magda. They were silent as well. Vert constantly on the lookout for danger and Lady Magda, with her nose in a leather-bound volume, pointedly ignoring all that surrounded her. Reiner rode behind them, and much to his annoyance, so did Eric. It was inevitable, of course. Other than Lady Magda, Reiner was the only person of Eric's class in the party. He was the only prisoner Eric could acknowledge as an equal, the only one he would deign to talk to. Reiner would have been much happier swapping body songs and barrack insults with Halls, Pavel and Giano, but Eric had attached himself like glue and babbled incessantly at his shoulder. If you were in Altdorf, you must have known my cousin, Viscount Norik Oberholt. He was trying to become a knight panther. Damned fine rider. Spent a lot of time at the plume and pennant. I'm afraid I didn't mix much with the orders. I was at university. Eric made a face. University? Gods! I had enough learning from my tutor. Were you studying to be a priest? Literature. When I studied at all, mostly I was just there to escape Dreyholt. Eh? What's wrong with Dreyholt? Excellent hunting there. Back the boar there once. Did you? Yes. Damn fine animal, I say. Your name is Hetzau. I believe I met your father on a droll hunt once. Jolly old fellow. Reiner winced. Oh, yes. He's always at his jolliest killing the lesser orders. There was a rustle in the dead grass beside the road. Giano instantly unslung his crossbow and fired. A rabbit bolted out of hiding and sprinted across the march. Before Giano could do more than cry out in disgust, Franz raised his bow from his shoulders and an arrow from his quiver and fired in a single smooth motion. 
The rabbit turned a cartwheel and flopped dead in the melting snow, a clothyard shaft between his shoulder blades. The entire party turned and looked at the boy with newfound respect. Even Eric nodded curtly. Neat shooting, that. Lad would make a fine beater. Franz hopped lightly off his horse, removed the arrow, and handed the rabbit to Giano, who had three more hanging from his pommel that he had shot earlier. One more for the stew, he said with a smirk. Grazie, boy, said Giano. Much thanks, yous. He added a coney to his brace. As Franz climbed back on his horse again, Reiner leaned in to Eric. Care to bet on who pots the next one? Eric pursed his lips. I never wager, except on horses. I say, have you seen the racers Count Schlager is breeding down at Helmgart? Damned fine runners. And on and on it went. Reiner groaned. Here he was, out in the world, free from prison, his neck spared, at least temporarily from the noose. But was he allowed to enjoy it? No. Apparently Sigmar had a nasty sense of humor. Eric was talking about his father's annual hunt ball now. It was going to be a long trip. Vert finally called a halt in the lee of a low cliff, just before sunset, and the men fell to making camp. Reiner found it curious that the men all found roles for themselves without any apparent communication. Pavel and Hals groaned about how sore they were from riding while they fetched water from a nearby stream and hunted for wild carrots and dandelion leaves to add to the stew. Reiner saw to the horses. Ulf erected Magda's tent and then assisted the others with theirs. Franz and Oscar collected wood and started a fire. Gustav flayed and deboned the rabbits with an intensity Reiner found disturbing, while Giano seasoned the stew and talked endlessly about how much better the food was in Tylea. The stew was delicious, if a bit garlicky for imperial tastes, and they slurped it down eagerly as they hunched close around the fire. Draw lots for tents, said Vert between mouthfuls. I'll not have anyone pulling rank or any fighting over who tends with who. You're all scum to me. The men made their marks on leaves and put them in a helmet. There were five tents, a fancy one for Lady Magda, a small one for Captain Vert, and three standard-issue cavalry tents, which slept four uncomfortably, as the old barracks joke went. So the nine men could sleep free in a tent. Luxury. But when the helmet passed to Franz, he passed it on without adding a lot. Can't write your own name, lad? asked Vert. I'll sleep alone, said Franz. Heads came up all around the fire. Vert scowled. You'll sleep with the others. There is no spare tent. I'll tent under my cloak. He looked straight into the fire. Reiner smirked. The army ain't all inverts, boyo. It only takes one. Soldier, said Vert with soft menace. Men who sleep alone tend to be found missing in the morning. Sometimes they run. Sometimes something takes them. I will allow neither. I need all the men I have for this goose chase. You? Captain, please, said Halls. Let him sleep alone. The last thing any of us needs is some excitable lad with a hair trigger cutting our throats for rolling over. A chorus of, aye, echoed from around the fire. Vert shrugged. It seemed that Francis' talk with the company, which had risen after his display of bowmanship, had fallen precipitously once again. When the lots were drawn with a blank leaf holding Francis' place, Reiner shared a tent with Pavel and Ulf. Hals, Giano, and Oscar had another, and Eric and Gustav had the third tent to themselves. Vert took the first watch, and the rest bedded down immediately, near dropping from their night and day in the saddle. Still, it took Reiner a while to get asleep. He couldn't stop thinking about what an odd lot of madmen and malcontents the company was. He couldn't understand why Waldenheim had entrusted them with such an important mission, and with the life of a woman 
he obviously held dear. Why hadn't he dispatched a squadron of knights to be her full escort? Reiner at last drifted off into fitful dreams, without having found a satisfactory answer to his questions.